Stead Microscopy, brought to you by the students of TMM3104. What is the smallest thing you can see with light? Well, let's put that in perspective. That's us there, humans. If we zoom in, if we really zoom in, 10 to the negative 7 times, that's 10 million times smaller than us. We'd get to an area that is the smallest thing visible under a light microscope or an optical microscope. And that's called the diffraction barrier. Ernst Abe, a German physicist, studied this, and he postulated that you can calculate this area with that formula right there where lambda is the wavelength and n sine theta is the numerical aperture. Now, if we plug in 500 nanometers and the modern optical numerical aperture, d would equal approximately 200 nanometer. That means that any two objects within 200 nanometer of each other are indistinguishable. In modern microscope, light passes through the aperture and then refracts causing interference and then blurriness. Manufacturing companies have tried to overcome this by creating special apertures that let in more light and lowering the refractive index uh, with oil immersion technique, but they can't get past the 60 times magnification. Scientists have also tried to break the barrier for a few decades now, and it started in the 80s. A professor called Soini at Turku University in Finland was working on electron and confocal microscopy at the European Molecular Biology Lab. He recruited other people, Heinonen, and another fellow called Stefan Hell to tackle this problem with him. They wrestled with it for a few years before Stefan Held returned to Turku University with a controversial idea that not only is it possible, but it's also feasible to break the diffraction barrier. He published a paper along with Wickman demonstrating the theoretical principles and outlining the experimental condition for this new concept, stimulated emission depletion fluorescent microscopy. People were skeptical, but then five years later, Hell and Clark published a paper showing that they actually assembled a fluorescent microscope sophisticated enough to provide the experimental proof of principle for said microscopy. How does it work exactly? Let's take a look. This is what happens under normal fluorescent microscopy. Proteins are tagged with fluorophores which can be excited with an excitation beam shown here in green. The diameter of this circle is 200 nanometer or the same size as the diffraction bear. And that means you can't tell the two lines apart. The flashing dots actually represent photons being emitted from electrons returning to their ground state after being excited by the excitation beam shown in green. Now how is this different in STAT microscopy? In STEM microscopy, there is another layer of light shown in red, or number 7, panel number 7. This extra layer of light is from the depletion laser which passes through a spiral faceplate forming an optical vortex where light emitted looks like a donut shape in the 2D plane. Electrons hit with the second light beam is stimulated to emit energy Thus, they don't emit the photon, and the donut shape is actually dark because electrons don't release photons. When overlaid with the normal beam, this creates a very small area where fluorophores can actually be activated and release photons. So here's the same diagram. The circle is much smaller, but we can build a bigger picture by taking many pictures of small circles and stitching them together row by row to create a bigger picture. We'd have to take more pictures because the dots are smaller, but that means the resolution is better. And because each dot is less than 200 nanometer, we can distinguish two objects which are less than 200 nanometers apart, breaking the diffraction barrier. This has many applications in molecular biology. One example is shown here. We're looking at focal adhesion proteins in green 
uh, contrasting metastatic cancer cells with normal cells. You can see at the bottom the difference in resolution between stent microscopy and regular confocal microscopy. This powerful tool of visualization can really give insight into pathways and diseases at the cellular level. And for the development of this technology, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2004 was awarded to Betzig, Hell, and Moriner for the development of super-resolved fluorescent microscopy. Thank you for watching.